we're going to go ahead and start with our next session, uh, which is if software is eating the world, AI is its teeth. It's a short presentation by Claire Zhao and Alex Argo. They're going to speak about the future of AI in education. Hi, everyone. I know we're on tight timing here, but I'm Claire, a VP at GSV. And I'm Alex, I'm an investor at GSV, and Claire and I have really been leading the charge on covering all of the crazy rapid developments around everything AI, especially as it pertains to education and skills. Obviously a hot topic it has been brought up, or ChatGPT has been brought up in every single panel. We only have 10 minutes, so we might speed through some things. But with that said, um, you know, Michael brought this up in his talk yesterday, but just the sheer speed at which ChatGPT reached 100 million monthly active users in just two months, especially when compared to some other consumer platforms, really signals that you know, AI is at an inflection point and that something special is happening. So what was the real catalyst for this was the introduction of the Transformer model in 2018. Um, and that really opened the floodgates for uh, a crazy amount of large language models, which are variations of the Transformer model, um, to come into the scene in the last two years, like a GPT-3, and really laid the foundation for some of these draw-dropping applications we've been seeing with this tech. And so the best way to think about all of this, describing it to, you know, say a 12-year-old, is that these large language models are extremely smart. They're trained on billions, if not trillions, of data parameters. And they're trained across very broad use cases. And we come back to this analogy of thinking of these LLMs as like your neighborhood handyman. They're quick to come to a solution. They're very smart. They can solve a variety of problems. But they're not going to get you to a very specific workflow or a specific domain because they haven't been trained on that. And so that's where these application layers come in across modalities of text, code, image, speech, video, and even um, science across biology and chemistry data as well. And so now we have, a, a on top of these foundational layers, we have application layers, which in the same analogy you can think of as the electricians, the plumbers, the interior designers that are going to come in and fill in the gaps that maybe a very broad handyman may not be able to do. They're going to be able to build into the workflow and train on very specific data with context for a very specific task or role. And in education, we're seeing applications across knowledge management, conversational AI, writing assistance, and so much more. And so taking a step back, what does this all actually mean for the future of education and work? Very naturally, it means that anyone, whether you're an educator, a student, a professional, can now be a content creator and create output at instant speed. And so we've seen how AI is highly functional, but I think another massive use case is how amazingly creative it is. Um, in a matter of seconds, it was able to create a five course menu for this conference. It was also able to, in 10 seconds, create a script about you all at this event today of 200 ed tech leaders coming together for an event at the Oberoi. But I think that all of this and text alone is just the tip of the iceberg. Think of a world where text, video, speech models all come together. You're now able to build a world of infinite customizable content that's highly personalized and generated at in, at, in real time. Stylization mode. Transfer the style of any image or prompt to every frame of your video. Storyboard mode. Turn mockups into fully stylized and animated renders. Mask mode. Isolate subjects in your video and modify them with simple text prompts. Render mode. Turn untextured renders into realistic outputs by applying an input image or prompt. And customization mode. Unleash the full power of Gen 1 by customizing the model for even higher fidelity results. So now anyone can be a video creator. Um, we're also seeing some of these similar advancements in audio, for example. This is pretty cool. <laughs> of others around the world who want to solve our climate crisis. As an actor, I pretend for a living. I play fictitious characters, often solving fictitious problems. I believe that mankind has looked at climate change in that same way, as if it were a fiction. As if pretending that climate change wasn't real would somehow make it go away. But I think we all know better than that now. And so content creation is just one piece of the broader spectrum of what generative AI can do. 
it's not only able to help us create something out of nothing, but it's also able to help us work through any brainstorm blocks we might have, help us get unstuck. It's able to assist us in our workflows and also improve what we've already created as humans. And this ultimately means that now anyone can access this creative power, creating output that is high quality, low cost, and at instant speed. So moving on to our second prediction, uh, we believe that education will finally go from one size fits all to one size fits one. So if you think about over time, why have we used you know, the same tests, the same assessments, the same quizzes for every single learner, right? When learners are actually very individual in their preferences and their capabilities. And so we think, especially with the type of content creation that Claire was talking about, that truly adaptive learning has finally arrived. And so if you think about how you can leverage this technology to not only uh, you know, create content and delivery that matches a learner's preferences, but also can meet the learner where they are in terms of progress, capabilities, um, and, and more. So it really unlocks um, a lot for individual learners. Um, and so we're already seeing this applied across pre-K to gray. Um, you know, in K-12, we're seeing this company, Koala, that think about if you're a parent um, or a teacher and uh, you, know, you wanna create content that matches standard you know, curriculum requirements, uh, but imagine if I am you know, a fourth grader and I love Superman and I would really love to see this curriculum or this content, but cater to my interests around Superman, you can do that instantly. And then uh, in the workforce, um, you know, this is a company, MEM, and we're seeing applications of being able to leverage you know, my knowledge that's scattered around many different platforms, as well as the knowledge that's scattered around for your organization, um, and really pull it together and help you connect the dots and basically create a personalized knowledge graph or a second brain for you that you can leverage while you're working. Our third big trend really centers around the modality of all of this and how we deliver learning education. Um, I think if we think back to the history of how humanity has interfaced with technology. We've every few decades evolved a little bit from desktop to laptop to touch screens and maybe even mo mobile um, and even e VR and AR coming soon. But I think for the first time in humanity's history, we're now able to talk to machines using AI in the same way that I would talk to Alex and have a conversation with her. And so there have been clear applications in tutoring that we've seen pop up with just our students using ChatGPT. But we see a world where every learner and professional and every human will have instant access 24-7 to a personal tutor, coach, mentor, therapist, even a friend that knows all of their history. And so a company called Digest, they're building an AI tutor in WhatsApp in your pocket you can access 24-7. Another company called Replica, building an AI companion that you can talk to about your problems, your life. And finally, another company called Speak, building a language tutor that is instantly accessible and highly fluent. You can use anytime, anywhere. Uh, our next prediction, and we did not come up with the term co-pilot, but you know, we believe that there will be AI co-pilots uh, for every single role and every single vertical uh, that will really help uh, individual workers and companies really leapfrog in terms of productivity. So the first instance we saw of this was within coding with a company called GitHub Copilot, where you know, if I'm a coder, I can have this embedded into my work and it can help me edit as well as generate code for me. And developers are already saying that this is making them 10 times more productive. And if you take that even a step further and think about how some developers, but then also non-technical workers are leveraging ChatGPT to create software and create code for them, this really is a massive unlock, the same way that Figma or Canva made non-designers be able to design. This is the same thing where you can have non-technical workers interact uh, with these tools to use natural language to create code. And we're seeing this in writing. We're seeing this in design. So again, think about a, a future where you have these co-pilots for every single vertical. Um, and our fifth and final prediction is that AI and education will and must meet in the middle. So what does this mean? You know, we've been here before. Um, if you think about the introduction of even as far back to as a calculator or, you know, Google search, Wikipedia, YouTube, Grammarly with spell check and grammar check, uh, and now we have ChatGPT, Education has to evolve and adopt to these technologies, and, and Monsi from Excel actually brought up her professor, Ethan Mollick, yesterday, um, and he's been really innovative with leveraging ChatGPT in the classroom, um, and he says, you know, large language models aren't going to get less capable in the next few years, and we need to figure out a way to adjust to these tools and not just ban them. 
Um, and so this really speaks to how educators have to figure out a way to leverage these tools. Also, if you think about a future, like I was talking about, where AI co-pilots are pervasive across every role, and that even new skills are gonna pop up if you think about an entirely new skill around how to prompt these models and get the most out of them and really leverage them. Um, educators need to help prepare these learners and these individuals for this future of work. Um, and so, again, on the one hand, you think about how educators and the education system obviously has to adapt and change to some of this new technology. But I think on the flip side, AI is also very far from being perfect. I think today in the last nine minutes, we've seen how magical some of this technology can be but AI is also a reflection of humanity's worst qualities. And so we're going to see a lot of issues come up around data privacy, bias and ethics, who gets to access this tech, who gets displaced, and we'll see it continue to evolve. But I think the key thing that we focus, or we think will succeed for anyone building in the intersection of AI and education is that they have to have a mentality of bringing the human in the loop. The solution will not be an AI that displaces or does all the work for a human but rather something that consistently takes an input from a human that builds the algorithm and improves the algorithm alongside them. And so clearly education is in for some massive change, but we believe that the best solutions are not only going to be those that understand the 100x leverage that you can get through AI, but those that come from people like you in the room, those who have understood and built and understand the perspectives of our learners, our educators, our teachers, our professionals, and are building for their pain points and their problems. Thank you. Give it up for Alex and Claire.